I haven't even finished writing this. I just want to mention this real quick. Um, after this, the video is scripted because it's such a huge topic. I didn't want to get anything wrong. I wanted this to be like a properly researched video. Um, this sucked to research because biblical scholars are just awful. Okay, not all of them. Not all of them are awful. There are some really good biblical scholars out there. But <laughs> so many of them, especially the Christian ones, um, like the, the ones that don't have like the amateur not amateur like the the armchair ones right the armchair apologists who think they have a better understanding of the bible than anyone else and therefore you know make websites and stuff um it's it's so hard to find what i want uh, for instance i was looking for um for stuff on the trinity uh, and i saw this verse that said oh god is there there's one god and they cited galatians 3:20 uh, which brought me to looking into Galatians 3.16, which is Paul talking about how, Abra how Abraham's seed uh, will is Jesus, and he'll and when the original scripture is saying that his seed will inherit the land, right? So basically, he says that God is like, "Hey Abraham, you will be a great nation, and your seed will inherit the land." Um, I'm paraphrasing. I skipped like three verses, but it's not important for this. Um, so Paul in Galatians 3.16 is saying that seed there wasn't plural, and it very clearly was. Uh, it was talking about Jesus because it was furthering his... Um, I don't want to say agenda, that's not the right word. It was furthering his belief. It was um, strengthening what he was saying, right? Which really annoys me because I used to do the same thing. Paul took this thing, this completely unrelated thing, and was like, hey, actually, this means this. Um, when it didn't mean that at all, and it was only to further his his belief. Um, the same thing happens with Elhanan being the one to kill Goliath, but it was actually David, but it wasn't actually David. You know, things are changed in order to further people's beliefs. Um, and there was the whole monolatry into monotheism thing that messed up a bunch of stuff that I'll get into later. Anyway, I haven't even finished writing this, I just wanted to bring that up, because researching this was a pain in the butt. Um, <laughs> I really hope you enjoy this. I had a lot of fun making it, but whew. I've been wanting to make this video for a while, but I wasn't sure exactly how to format it. Each topic I want to talk about is spread out through the video because of the iceberg format. I'm going to go through the video and take everything from a given topic that I want to discuss, like the Trinity. Some things are only one point, like Behemoth. I won't be talking about everything, and each topic here will be surface level, but I just want to bring up different possibilities, especially with my different beliefs. This isn't trying to debunk Windagoon or whatever, since a lot of people really do believe a majority of what he says, that's not the point of this. I'm just bringing forward a few different ideas and topics surrounding a bit of what he talked about. Link to the original video in the description, of course, and at the end I'll be talking about something he said in his Angelology video, which you should also watch. Great videos, both of them. I just thought I had something worthwhile to add. God the Father makes up the main or the heavenly part of the Trinity of the Godhead. In the Bible, God is often referred to as the Trinity, or in other parts, it is one God divided into three separate parts. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus, which is also known as the Son of God, is not literally an offspring of God himself, or at least not in the Christian canon, and is instead the part of God that was made human for a time on earth in order to be the sacrifice for sins. So while we're still establishing God the Father, is in heaven or you could think as the soul the holy spirit works on heaven and earth and you could think of as the spirit and then the son of god or jesus was made flesh on earth and you could think as the body which is where common ideas of soul body and spirit come to mind there is a trinity but it's never once said that all three are the same being there are several verses that talk of the trinity such as matthew 28 19 go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit or even something like Romans 1.4, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of Holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. These verses clearly state that three separate parts of some Godhead exist, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, but it never states that they're one being. There are verses that state there is one God, such as James 2.19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. This leads into a huge rabbit hole. Multiple gods are mentioned. They are truly deities, not some idols that man has created for themselves. A good example of this is in the second Ten Commandments, the ones we all know of as THE Ten Commandments. I won't get into that now, it's not important. The first one being Exodus 23. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
Why would this be mentioned if there were no other gods? It also doesn't say that you can't have other gods, though the monotheistic angle is hammered into way harder later on in the Bible. A good portion of the Bible was written when Judaism was much more similar to the Canaanite religion, when it was polytheistic and monolatrism. Windigoon even brings this up at the end of the iceberg, but as a variation on God of the Gaps. Normally, God of the Gaps is cited as people explaining things they don't understand, like coincidences or even placebo, with God, but this is another version of it. All this to say that the verse here is either ignoring several instances of mentioning other gods, or simply saying that there's one true god, a monolatry. The word here can also be used to refer to the Godhead as a whole, rather than just one piece of it. The word used for believe can mean to entrust a thing to one, or even be used to simply imply faith. There are so many different interpretations in this verse that have gotten lost over the years, and that goes for every single verse. Every single verse I reference, I run through Strong's to find different potential meaning rather than just the normal translations we see every day, like the KJV, the NIV, or even the NASB. It's impossible to know the exact beliefs of the writers of the Bible through translation alone, which is why I wanted to go on a deeper dive of some of the aspects of this iceberg. Back to the point though, it's not necessarily stated that there is only one god, nor is it implied that the three members of the godhead are one being. It is not necessarily one god divided like Windigoon says, but rather three beings that make up a godhead. At least it can be read as that. Again, this isn't debunking, this is bringing forward another interpretation. Not even the Holy Spirit is conflated with the Father. The Holy Spirit is considered a helper that Jesus sent. John 15, 26, and 27. I will send you the helper from the Father. The helper is the spirit of truth who comes from the Father. When he comes, he will tell about me, and you will tell people about me too, because you have been with me from the beginning. Helper here can also be used as comforter, but I think the most accurate word for it would be succorer, someone who helps in times of hardship. The spirit is meant to teach them a deeper understanding of the gospels, or the truth in these verses. Whoops, kind of jumped the gun on this one and talked about it earlier, but uh, the trinity in the Old Testament, like I said, the fact that Elohim is used as both plural and singular, and the fact that God said, make man in our image. Um, yeah, whoops, accidentally got to that too early. Moving on. When God says, in our image, it's likely that it refers to the divine council, or even lesser gods. The divine council is its own rabbit hole, I'll link a video in the description that explains it really well and succinctly, but essentially, it was a group of divine beings that helped and advised God. The idea of the Godhead wasn't even accepted until 325 CE in order to consolidate Jesus being God with the non-polytheism of the day. Remember, Judaism wasn't a monotheism, it was a monolatrism for most of his existence. And it wasn't considered monotheistic until around the 6th century BCE. Elohim being used as a plural is not used in reference to the Trinity. Elohim is simply the Hebrew word for a divine being. It's used to refer to angels, lesser gods, the divine council, godlike beings, and even God himself. Of course, I've already brought up the existence of lesser gods and explained it, so no need to go into that. The Flood is the event that takes place in Genesis that essentially works as a reset for the whole world. At the time, it says that every single thought of man was evil, but the only righteous was Noah and his family, to which Noah built an ark and was saved from the Flood itself. I won't spend too much time on this, I'm just gonna say the worldwide Flood didn't happen. You can very clearly tell that not everywhere was flooded with water because of geology and the like. I won't go too much into this part of it, Aaron Ra has an incredible series where he deconstructs the absurdity of the Flood in excruciating detail and it's incredible. That will be linked in the description. The entire Mesopotamian area was a huge floodplain, so it's likely that there was a massive flood, but it definitely wasn't worldwide. This is also likely why so many other religions, like the Babylonians, also have flood myths. So let's connect some dots here. We have the Leviathan and Satan as the same thing at the end of the Bible. In the middle of the Bible, we have the Leviathan being described as a great serpent. And then if you're familiar with the beginning of the Bible in the Garden of Eden, it says that Satan came to Eve as a serpent and got her to commit the first sin, leading many to believe that perhaps Leviathan, this giant, potentially 300 mile long serpent, is the serpent that caused the first sin and therefore the downfall of humanity. Which I think it's really wild to think about, like what if instead of like a little garden snake that everyone thinks of, this thing was like, just huge. Leviathan itself is a weird one. For instance, some scholars believe Leviathan is a crocodile. The fact that God killed Leviathan before the world came out of chaos despite Michael coming to kill Leviathan, all that. But I mostly want to talk about the serpent in the garden. This serpent was not Satan. I guess technically it was a Satan, but it's not the devil as we think of him. The devil being a bad guy at all is purely a New Testament idea. Satan is a title, not a name, and it means roughly the adversary. The Satan would be the one to test humans, see Job, as part of the divine council that I mentioned earlier. It's also entirely possible that the serpent in Genesis was literally just a normal snake. 
Enoch mentions an angel called Azazel that also may have been the serpent, as the word used for the kind of angel Azazel is, a seraph, can be used to mean serpent, but that's not even set in stone. I love the idea of Azazel being the serpent, it gives so much interconnectedness to the mythos, but Azazel is almost definitely not the serpent, or not the original intention at least. Behemoth, or Behemoth as it's often called, is a sort of controversial passage that's mentioned in the book of Job. So the book of Job's in the Old Testament, right? So before the life of Christ and before sort of modern times. Now in other places in the Bible, behemoth is used as an adjective, like they speak of the behemoth acting men and stuff like that. However, Job specifically mentions a creature he refers to as behemoth, which he gives details like having bones of iron and mighty jaws and a tail like cedar. And while there's no conclusive definition of what this is, a lot of people point towards things like the tail of cedar, meaning that this was a dinosaur. Especially since the reason Job's describing it is how great and mighty and huge it is. This would mean that dinosaurs had to live after the Great Flood, and either been hunted out or died out at some point after. I should also mention that the second most popular theory about it is that it's a hippo. What? Anyway. <laughs> Like, that's such a crazy jump. It's either like a stegosaurus or a big water horse. Behemoth is an elephant. There's no debating this one. It's a big, strong animal that is small enough to fit under trees, so it's obviously not a dinosaur like the brontosaurus that has a tail like a cedar tree. Elephant tails look extremely similar to a tree called the Lebanese cedar tree. It has a long trunk made of soft fibers and a clump of leaves on top. It sways much easier than a modern American cedar and looks much more like an elephant tail. The passage is also talking about the movement of the tail, not the size. Behemoth is an elephant. All right, so the watchers are interesting. They are mentioned in the actual Bible in the story of Daniel, whenever Daniel is talking to the King Nebuchadnezzar, and they communicate to each other that they saw watchers come down from heaven in order to speak to the king. So watcher in this form is being used to describe angels of some sort. Keep in mind the book of Enoch, which I talked about earlier, talks at great length about these watchers and says they're the ones that came down from earth, or at least some of them came down to earth when they fell from grace and created the giants on earth. The watchers, as Wendigoon mentioned, are talked about extensively in Enoch. I wish he would have gone over some of them, but I guess that's why I'm doing this, huh? The Watchers are by far my favorite part of Jewish and Christian mythology. I plan on actually reading through the three books of Enoch and the Book of Giants to actually make a proper video on them, but for now, the Watchers came down from heaven to, well, watch. Specifically, watch humans. They have children with human women, who are the Nephilim. The Nephilim mentioned in the Book of Giants are pretty weird, like Humbaba, the Babylonian monster who protects the cedar forest where the gods live, actually being a mythologized Nephilim. Same with Gilgamesh himself. The watches themselves are extremely varied, such as Samyaza, who Wendigoon later talks about. Which I don't have a lot to say because I wasn't able to find a lot of distinct information on, is the leader of the Watchers that is mentioned in First Enoch. Now this gets into a whole lot bigger implications, right? If First Enoch is not an actual part of the Bible or an illegitimate part of the Bible, then how does it have all of this information? How is there this hierarchy of angels? Were the Watchers real? Etc. Etc. They're also called Samyazaz, Semiaza, Shamyaza, Shemihaza, you get the idea. They were the leader of the Watchers and taught humans magics like divination, at least as far as I can tell. Azazel was a seraphim who taught humans war, metallurgy, and weaponry. Azrael is the angel of death, and it's believed that Azrael was the one who killed the firstborns of the Egyptians during the plagues. All the Watchers who had children with men were cast from heaven and no longer serve God. This is pure conjecture, but it does seem to parallel the fall of angels in Revelation pretty well. This may be where that stemmed from. Naked boy fleeing from Gethsemane is a really random and weird one. So in the book of Mark, which again, one of the gospels that talks about the life of Jesus, for two verses, out of nowhere, it says, while Jesus was being arrested by Roman soldiers, so this was immediately after Judas betrayed and told the soldiers where Jesus was, that a boy who was naked in nothing except a linen robe that he was wearing around them, began to follow the parade of soldiers that had Jesus arrested, to which the Romans tried to chase him off. They ripped the linen off of him and he ran into the night naked. And that's the only mention of it. I don't have much for this one. I just have an interesting theory my mom had on this one a few years ago. She mentioned that she thought this was someone who took Jesus' message to sell everything they owned and follow him completely, literally. That's about it. 
Cain's death is referring to Cain, the brother of Abel, who committed the first murder. Because of his sin of killing his brother and again committing the first murder, it's said in Genesis that Cain is forced to walk the earth. Now, it's said that Cain was afraid of walking the earth because some group of people would find him and kill him, so God gave him a mark that would protect him from death. And that's the last that Cain's ever mentioned. Something Wendigoon mentions in his video on Dante's Paradiso is that some people believed Cain was actually forced to walk the moon because the moon is part of Earth and the craters were marks of Cain. Anyway, I wanted to bring this up because you should watch the Dante videos from Wendigoon. And watch the original video of the iceberg. It's a good video, I didn't even cover half of it. There's such a spirit of nihilism that can exist in the modern world, right? We're not just the modern world, any time throughout history. And people ask the question of, oh, well, how do you have hope? How do you have purpose? Like, what's it mean? And regardless, like, you, I'm not saying you have to believe it. I'm not trying to sell you on something or whatever. But to have someone believe that that whole thing I mentioned at the end, that they are an infinitely potential being made in a picture of God with guardian Holy Spirits to watch over them, like, that's got to give you some form of purpose <laughs> or some level of meaning or worth to yourself. And I think a lot of the evils that we see just come from people just having a lack of existence or not really knowing purpose. The final thing I want to touch on is part of his conclusion in his Angelology video. This part is unscripted. I just want to, you know, speak from the heart for this one. Um, my sense of purpose as an atheist doesn't come from any higher purpose. Um, I just want to be happy right and i don't think that's too out there of a concept um that's kind of what we evolved for right any i mean assuming you believe we involved we evolved um like no matter your worldview i think being happy is a solid goal um and that's like why we're here if you think about it from a from an evolutionary perspective uh, we evolved to be happy right everything we do that was good for us released dopamine and serotonin or whatever and that made us happy so we would do things that would make us happy uh, if, if you're a religious you know whatever god you believe in likely wants you to be happy right that's at least how it was for me when i was a christian um and i'm sure most worldviews feed back into that uh, so instead of needing to get your purpose from a higher power i think it's a lot more fulfilling at least for me personally to say that i can have purpose without needing some out there concept uh, and i'm not trying to discredit people's beliefs i think it's okay to have those beliefs as long as of course you're not harming anyone with those beliefs that's the main reason i speak out uh, and why i share my experience with christianity and my dissent with it because th the version of christianity that i subscribe to was extremely harmful including to myself um but so just know if you are struggling with your sense of purpose really all you need to do is try to be happy do things that make you happy you know play video games if it makes you happy watch youtube videos make youtube videos study philosophy uh, make music listen to music just do whatever makes you happy i think that should be everyone's purpose honestly anyway thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed i've been wanting to make this video for a while uh, i just now got around to it obviously uh, I was gonna make it a long time ago before Wendigoon even hit a million subscribers But I just kept pushing it off because I didn't want to have to go through the entire video and rearrange everything This didn't even take that long. It only took a few hours to make. I was just being lazy um, But I do think that this was a fun interesting video to make so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I love you all and I don't know how to end this